Hello everyone, welcome again to Modeling Methods and Mechanical Engineering and today we're going to uh, continue our discussion on second order uh, ordinary differential equations and in particular and the application of these to initial value problems. Um, and uh, we are going to look at uh, how to adapt the numerical schemes and numerical solution schemes that we've, uh, we've already formulated for first order ODEs and systems of first order ODEs uh, to these second order ODEs and even higher ODEs. And, and you'll see that um, the extension is, uh, is, is quite direct, uh, it's very general, and um, just by implementing a little trick by which we can take a second order ordinary differential equation and transform it into a set of, of two first order differential equations. For that matter, we can take any n order differential equation uh, and uh, transform it into a set of n first order differential equations. It's a very simple trick. So let me uh, let me get straight to it. So this is uh, modeling methods in HEMI. And uh, we're going to talk about numerical approximation schemes or solution schemes. for second order and higher ODEs. And in particular, in this case, we're talking about initial value problems, because remember, uh, numerical schemes rely on the fact that you're seeking the approximation of the particular solution, so you need the proper set of conditions to be able to get there. So, two approximate the solution of an order of a, let's say a second order, to begin with, second order uh, initial value problem, or an order for that matter, we may easily transform the second order or an order ODE into a set of two or n coupled first order ODEs. So we can always take a, an n order ODE and transform it into a set of n first order ODEs. And the way this goes is, so for instance, let's do this with a second order ODE. Um, given the governing equation, and let's just make it general, um, and let's, um, for the sake of argument, do this is, uh, yeah, let's do a of t, d second y, dt square of t plus b of t, um, dy dt plus c of t, y of t is equal to some function uh, we're going to call g of t, some non-homogeneous function. So you see that we're making this equation now non-homogeneous uh, and also variable coefficients. So these coefficients a, b, c, we're making a variable coefficient. So this one doesn't have a general analytical solution. So we have to rely on this uh, numerical solution. It's still linear, but it's non-homogeneous and variable coefficients. And then a set of initial conditions such that dy, I'm sorry, let's start with y at 0 is equal to y0, and dy dt at 0 is equal to some b0. So this is just y, and this is dy dt. All right, so what do we do? The first thing we do is we let dy dt be equal to some 
new function v of t, right? And uh, if we differentiate this, so this is what we're going to let arbitrarily. We're going to say, I'm going to take the derivative of y and call it a new function, a new unknown function called v of t. And if we take the derivative of these, then we get the derivative of the right-hand side, dv dt of t. So if we follow this logic and then use it to replace the governing equation, so plug into governing equation, and then we'll have a of t um, dv dt plus b of t of b. So here plus c of t of y of t is equal to g of t. So, so far I haven't done anything, um, but just replace the, the second y and the y of t with a new independent variable, v. Now, if you notice, this actually gives rise to two equations because on this equation we can solve for dv dt, Solving for dv dt from the governing equation, we get dv dt is equal to minus c of t a of t times y of t minus b of t a of t times v of t minus or plus g of t divided by a of t. Now, and now if we take this equation and combine it with our arbitrary assumption that the y dt was equal to v, so combining with the definition of v of t, we have dy dt is equal to what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this definition and I'm going to say this is zero times y of t this is plus one times v of t and this is plus zero so this is exactly the same as this so I'm just adding a couple zeros right there and then the v dt is equal to minus c of t, a of t, y of t, minus b of t, a of t, v of t, plus g of t, divided by a of t. And as you can see, notice that these is a set of two first order coupled ODEs. Right. If we could change the notation and let y of t be equal to y1 and v of t be equal to y2 so that we can employ the same notation we use for systems of equations then we have y1 dot is equal to 0 y1 plus 1 y2 plus 0 and y2 is equal to minus c over a y1 minus b over a y2 plus g over a okay right? so then we can collapse this into a system that looks like y1 of t um, y2 of t equals to a matrix of coefficients 
0, 1, um, minus C over A, minus B over A, Y1, Y2, <clears throat> is equal to, oh, so plus, not equal, plus 0, and GT, AT. And there's your coupled system of equations, which you can solve with any of the techniques that we've already learned for systems of first order differential equations. This is all first order. So this is the first derivative of y1, the first derivative of y2. And in, with initial conditions, so the in, initial conditions can be written very simply as y1 of 0 and y2 of 0 equal to whatever was given for y1 or for y and whatever was given for the derivative of y, which was b0. And that's it. That's how we formulate a problem, the original second order of the E, as a set of first order of the E's. And when we solve this problem, we're basically going to get two solutions. We're going to get y1 and we're going to get y2. Well, remember, y1 is the solution itself. So y1 is equal to um, y. And y2 is equal to v, which is equal to the derivative of y. So we automatically, by solving this, we get the dependent variable y, and we get its derivative with respect to time at all time stops automatically. So, therefore, the um, already established predictor, corrector, schemes for systems of first order ODEs may be employed to approximate the solution of these problems. Furthermore, these same approach can be easily generalized to higher order ODEs, where again, if I give you a fifth order ODEs, then you can transform it into a system of five first order ODEs. All right, so let's uh, let's work on an example, and uh, example solve the following. IVP. So um, we have a governing equation d second y dt square minus dy dt minus 2y of t is equal to 10 sine of t with initial conditions y of 0 is equal to minus 3 and dy dt is equal to minus 2. So, since this is a um, second order linear, not homogeneous, but it's constant coefficient, uh, ordinary differential equation, since these linear second order ODE is constant coefficient, Uh, an analytical solution is available. So 
let's first find the analytical solution, the exact solution. Again, that is not always the case, and it's actually the case and very seldom. Uh, so, because not, not uh, uh, usually, but uh, again, for illustration purposes, let's, I picked a problem that we can solve analytically so that we can compare the numerical approximation and see how good it is. So the first thing we do, remember, is to let y of t be equal to the homogeneous solution plus the specific solution, such that the homogeneous problem satisfies the homogeneous version of this differential equation. Minus 2 y homogeneous of t is equal to 0. So we're basically going to be solving the homogeneous version of the second order of the e's. And as you can see, a is equal to 1, b is equal to minus 1, and c is equal to minus 2. Based on that, we can, again, solve the adjoint problem and figure out the two roots, m1, m2, is equal to minus b, so 1, plus minus the square root of b squared, which is minus 1 squared. So I'm going to say minus minus 1, so there's no confusion. Minus 4 times a times c divided by... 2 times a, and that would lead to the two roots, m1 being 2 and m2 being minus 1. Okay, I did it on purpose so that we get uh, integer roots. So these roots are roots are real and distinct, and therefore the homogeneous solution is equal to some constant of integration c1 times e to the first root t plus c2 times e to the second root t. So that's a homogeneous solution. You can try it. You can differentiate this once and twice and then plug it in here and you will see that it satisfies. All right, but that doesn't satisfy the original equation. Now, in order to satisfy the original equation, we need to propose an arbitrary solution. So uh, to solve for the specific solution or specific component of the solution, we have to realize that the right-hand side of the equation, so RT is equal to 10 sine of T. And therefore, we're going to let Ys of T be equal to trigonometric function. So if the function that was originally in the equation, the forcing function is a trigonometric function sine of t, we are going to pick k0 cosine of t plus k1 sine of t. So even though this forcing function only has the sine in it, we're going to have to pick the two, sine and cosine, and you'll see the reason why. Times coefficients, and notice that the that the argument of the cosine and the sine are exactly the same as the argument of the original forcing function. If this were the sine of 4t, then we have to pick the cosine of 4t and the sine of 4t. Then we differentiate this twice. The derivative of these is minus k0 sine of t plus k1 cosine of t. And the second derivative of these... is equal to minus k0 uh, cosine of t minus k1 sine of t. See? And if there is an argument in there, that argument will come multiplying here, and then will come up multiplying again. So if this was 4t, then you'll have 4k0, 16k0, and so on. All right. So we're going to take this and plug these into ODE, into the original ODE, not the homogeneous version. Remember the ODE states that the second derivative of y uh, d d squared, I'm going to call this the specific function, um, uh, minus the derivative of ys with respect to t, 
minus 2 ys of t is equal to 10 sine of t. So I'll plug all of these in here, and this is what I'm going to get. I'm going to use some brackets here. So the second derivative will be minus k0 cosine of t minus k1 sine of t. Um, then I get minus dy dt, which is minus k0 sine of t plus k1 cosine of t. And then um, this one, minus 2 times ys, which is k0 cosine of t plus k1 sine of t is equal to 10 sine of t. All right, so what I'm trying to do now is, is a method of uh, unknown uh, coefficients, um, undetermined coefficients. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect everything that multiplies the cosine and then everything that multiplies the sine. So as you can see, what multiplies the cosine on the left-hand side is minus k0, minus k1, and minus 2 k0. So I get uh, minus k0, minus k1, and minus 2 k0, multiplying the cosine of t. And uh, whatever multiplies the sine is minus k1, minus k1, I'm sorry, plus k0. So we have minus k1, minus minus plus k0, and uh, minus 2k1 times the sine of t. And this is equal to 10 times the sine of t on the right-hand side. And let me keep solving this, and this will be minus 3k0 minus k1 times the cosine of t plus um, k0 minus 3k1 times the sine of t is equal to 10 sine of t. 10 times the sine of t. And you can see now that because the sine and the cosine are two linearly independent functions, later on we're going to show that these are called orthogonal functions to each other. These are independent coefficients, so whatever multiplies the sine here has to be equal to whatever multiplies the sine on the right-hand side, and whatever multiplies the cosine has to be equal to whatever multiplies the cosine on the right-hand side, which is zero. So this leads to two equations, minus 3k0 minus k1 should be equal to zero, so this should be equal to zero. Well, this should be equal to 10. So k0 minus 3k1 should be equal to 10. And we solve that system of two equations by whatever means you want. You can set up a matrix, and this is a right-hand side vector, or you can just do by reduction. You multiply the second equation by 3 and then subtract them and so on. But at the end of the day, you'll find a unique solution that says that k0 is equal to 1 and k1 is equal to minus 3. That is the unique solution to the system, the swap house system of equations. You can plug in k0, you can plug in 1 here and minus 3 here, and you'll see that you get 0. And you can plug in 1 here and minus 3 here, and you see you get 10. So the specific solution is then the cosine of t minus 3 sine of t. It's k0 cosine plus k1 times the sine. That was the original k0 that we, the original ys that we proposed, k0 times the cosine of t plus k1 times the sine of t. And again, you can, you can verify this, plug it in here, and you'll see that it satisfies perfectly. Plug it into this equation right here. Okay. So we have the homogeneous solution, and we have the specific solution. So the general solution y of t, which is given by y homogeneous plus y specific, is equal to c1 e to the 2t plus c2 e to the minus t plus the cosine oh, sorry, of t minus 3 sine of t. Now we have a mix of trigonometric and exponential functions. 
but still this is a general solution because we have constants of integration there that we have to determine using initial conditions. So the initial conditions are y at 0 is equal to minus 3, dy dt is equal to minus 2. So those are the initial conditions for the dependent variable and its derivatives. Um, so if dy dt is um, equal to this, I'm sorry, if y of t is equal to this, then dy dt is equal to the derivative of these, which is 2c1 e to the 2t minus c2 e to the minus t um, minus the sine of t minus 3 cosine of t. So I'm going to plug that into these equations. And that's going to lead to uh, y0 is equal to minus 3, which is equal to this evaluated at 0, which is c1 plus c2 plus 1 minus 3 times 0. Okay, the sine of 0 is equal to 0. And dy dt is equal to 0, has a condition of minus 2, and that's equal to c1, sorry, 2c1 minus c2 um, minus the sine of 0, which is 0, minus 3 times the cosine of 0, which is 1. Right? So this leads to two equations with two unknowns. C1 plus C2 is equal to, my, is equal to uh, minus 3 minus 1, so it's minus 4. And this one is 2C1 minus C2 is equal to minus 2 plus 3, which is 1. And this leads to an equation, a system of equations, two equations with two unknowns that leads to C1 equals minus 1 and C2 equals minus 3. And then that leads to the particular solution. Y of T is equal to, well, C1 is equal to minus 1. So this is minus e to the 2t. C2 is equal to minus 3, minus 3e three to the minus t, plus the cosine of t, minus 3 sine of t. There we go. And that's uh, the final solution. That solution satisfies the homogeneous, the specific portion of the equation, it satisfies the original differential equation, and it satisfies both initial conditions, y at 0 is equal to minus 3, and the derivative of these evaluated at 0 gives you minus 2. So that's the exact solution. Now we need to approximate this numerically and see if we can get to an answer that is close to this one. So numerically, Again, let, um, again, um, y of t equals, I'm sorry, dy dt equals v of t. So the equation that is given is dv dt minus v of t minus 2y of t is equal to 10 times the sine of t. So this is the second derivative of y. This is the first derivative. Of, this is the equation that was given originally. So this leads to a system of equations then that goes like dy dt is equal to v and dv dt is equal to 2yt my, or plus v of t plus 10 sine of t. We can rewrite this in terms of y1 and y2. dy1 dt is equal to 0y1 of t plus 1 y2 of t 
So we're going to let y be equal to y1 and b equals to y2. And then the derivative of y2 with respect to t is equal to 2y1 plus 1y2 plus 10 sine of t. And this was plus 0. So we can write this into the usual y dot is equal to a times y plus g. So the state representation of the system of equations, uh, where a is equal to the matrix 0, 1, 2, 1. And g of t is the vector of independent terms 0 and 10 sine of t. So notice that the matrix, even though it could actually be, in general, a function of t, is a constant uh, matrix, a constant coefficient. And also, y1 at 0, y2 at 0 are given the initial conditions are given by minus 2, I'm sorry, minus 3, and minus 2. Those are the original given initial ones. So this is what we're going to program. Uh, and basically what we're going to use is the same MathCAD file that we used last time, the one that solves systems of equations, and we are going to implement the system right here. So implement this, this in MathCAD. Uh, with k equal to uh, first order coupled ODEs. And that's it. So basically taking this problem and then compare it to the, uh, to the exact solution that we just derived. Let's see what happens. All right. So let's see. So remember the matrix is 0, 1, 2, 1. Uh, the right-hand side vector of independent terms is 0 times 10 sine of t. And the initial conditions are minus 3 and minus 2. That's basically what we have to give to the MathCAD spreadsheet, along with, you know, what's the final time for evaluations, how many time steps we want. And we are going to introduce this as the exact solution. In addition, the derivative of these, which is given by this expression with c1 equals minus 1 and c2 equals minus 3. So those will be y1 and y2. Those, those are the exact solutions for this problem. So let's see. Let's go back to let's go MathCAD. And again, this is a numerical approximation scheme for second order ODEs, but it can be higher, second order, I'm going to say, or higher. ODEs, right? So again, uh, I am going to use the same spreadsheet that I uh, wrote for the previous class in which we solve uh, systems of first order ODEs. I established the origin of the arrays at one. Um, it's a little bit less confusing that way when we have multiple uh, solutions, Y1, Y2, Y3, just to keep uh, bookkeeping of those. I'm going to set k equal to because we have two equations. If this were a originally a fifth order ODE, then it would be transformed into a set of five order uh, of, of five first order ODEs, and therefore k will be equal to five. The matrix A is zero, one, two, one, as we just derived. The right hand side vector of independent terms is zero and ten sine of t, and the vector of initial conditions is minus three, minus two. The vector that contains the exact solutions as we derived them, minus e to the 2t, minus 3e to the minus t, plus a cosine of t, minus 3 sine of t. Again, that satisfies both the homogeneous and non-homogeneous part of the solution, and it also uh, satisfies the initial conditions. And the derivative of these, this is y1, the derivative of these is y2, so if I take the derivative of these, I get minus 2e to the 2t, plus 3e to the minus 3, minus t, minus sine of t, minus 3 cosine of t. All right, 
So I'm going to establish that the final time for evaluation is going to be equal to one. So I'm, that's up until I, I am interested in knowing the solution. And I'm going to start with a very coarse uh, discretization of the time domain. I'm going to say the number of time steps equal to 10. So therefore the time step size delta T is final time divided by N. It's only 0 0.1 seconds. Okay. Then I establish uh, N as the range variable going from one to N plus one. Okay, no, now notice that it starts at 1 instead of at 0, because arrays are supposed to start at 1, because I said the origin at 1. is delta t times n to the minus 1. So again, if I print t, I get an array that is indexed by this range variable that goes from 1 to 11, and it starts at 0 and it ends at 1, that being the final time of evaluation. All right, and I also evaluate the exact solution, right? The exact solution now is going to be an array that has two indices. So it's going to have 11 uh, rows and two columns, each of the columns representing each of the two solutions. It's basically the evaluation of this vector y of t, uh, y k at tn. So if I say what is wx, so w exact, is again a vector that has 11 rows and two columns. Start with the initial condition as expected because these solutions satisfy the initial condition, um, and that uh, and it takes from there. All right. So the first uh, is the Euler method. Again, there's no change uh, from this one to the one that I uh, went over on the last uh, on the last class. So basically, uh, just an implementation of the same algorithm. Then the same thing for the modified Euler. I just take the same exact, I just took the same exact uh, algorithm and paste it here. For the Hoynes method, the same thing. So I independently calculate the, the predictor for each of the state variables, k from one to two, and the corrector for each of the state variables, and then I combine them into uh, the solution at the next time level. And then the Runge Kuta, which was, well, has one predictor, k1, and three correctors, k2, k3, k4. To produce a solution at the next time level y n plus one and again this solution has has multiple columns representing the multiple state variables in this case y1 and y2 only after this is uh, this takes place then i am interested in printing the solution at, uh, k equal one which is basically the solution y1 which is the solution y if i did this for y2 i will be printing the derivative of the solution notice that the, der the y1 Remember y exact, if I print it here, is an array of 11 uh, by 2, and the solution y1 represents y, and the solution y2 represents the derivative of y with respect to t. That's why this one, the initial condition starts at minus 3, and this one, the initial condition starts at minus 2. So I am interested in the solution itself. I'm not interested in the derivative unless there's a reason why I'd be interested in the derivative with respect to time. And I'm plotting the exact solution and symbols for the Euler solution, modified Euler's, Hoynes, and Runge Kuta, as well as calculating the residuals as I did last time. Um, notice that the residual for the Euler solution is 7.27%. That's the blue squares. It's kind of deviated from the exact. The residual for the modified Euler is 0.42%. For the Hoynes, is 0.43%. And for Runge Kuta, is 8.9 times 10 to the minus 4%. So much, much better. Not only that, if I were to change the size of the time steps to, let's say, 100, I should expect the error to decrease proportionally. And that is proportionally, proportionally to delta t itself when it comes to Euler. So it was 7.27. If, if I update this, F9, now I get 0 0.75, so one order of magnitude by a factor of 10, roughly. This should actually change by a factor of 100, so 10 squared. If I update this, notice that there's two zeros added here to the right of the decimal place. And if I update this, again, two zeros added to, so roughly a factor of 100. It's not exactly 100, but it's in the order of magnitude. That's what that means. And this one in particular, which was 8.9 times 10 to the minus 4, if I update this one, I get 9 times 10 to the minus 8. Again, four order of magnitudes, orders of magnitude, because I modify delta t by a factor of 10. I should expect the error to decrease by a factor of 10,000, and that's indeed what happened. At least as, as long as you're not 
close to the machine precision, um, where that error you would just stagnate and stop decreasing, then it will decrease proportionally to at least four orders of magnitude here if you decrease time by one order of magnitude for the time step. So that's it. Um, again, I'm going to post these uh, these uh, MathCat spreadsheet along with this video on the Canvas site, and uh, you'll have access to it, and you can play with it or formulate different problems or work on the assignment problems, which are uh, pretty much related to these um, to these problems. So you can uh, you can use the spreadsheets for that purpose. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll see you next class.